Welcome to the Journey to the Draft podcast. I'm Fran Duffy, and I'm excited to continue our series here on the podcast. We're going to continue catching up with people all across the entire scope of the NFL draft industry, whether they're people that evaluate in the media or in the league or have done a little bit of both. We're going to continue talking with them as we lead up to the 2019 NFL season, the 2019 college football season, obviously kicking off at the end of August. So today, we're going to welcome in Kyle Krabs from the Draft Network, and we have a great relationship with those guys. They come on the show throughout the course of the season, so we'll be talking to those guys in the future. We have in the past. We're going to have Kyle on today, talk about his entire background, how he got into the scouting business, really who his biggest influences were, and then also what his philosophies are with evaluating players and projecting them to the NFL. Obviously an ever-evolving business, and we'll continue to talk about that with Kyle. Then we'll wrap things up uh, with some draft mailbag. we got a great question here from our Apple Podcast page, but like I said, let's kick, th- kick things off here with Mr. Relevant and Kyle Krabs. It's time for Mr. Relevant. So really happy to welcome in Kyle Krabs back to the Journey to the Draft podcast. Kyle's been on the show numerous times before uh, talking about prospects leading up to the 2019 draft. Well, now we're going to take our first little peek to 2020, but we'll touch on that in a little bit. I want to first, as we've done over the last few weeks, really talk big picture. So Kyle, my first question to you is this. Take us through now your overall, your first steps going into an evaluation. What are some of the things that you want to do uh, as you get ready to watch a player really for the first time because this is that time of year? Sure. So throughout the course of your previous studies for the previous draft class, you get a great opportunity to kind of get some peripheral looks at guys and and you keep that list around you of names that kind of grabbed your attention, but you weren't really studying them. So you, you know who you want to prioritize going in, but this is a lot of the background research. You know, how highly were they coveted coming out of high school and prep? Were they, you know, blue chip uh, recruits or were they late bloomers kind of gives you an idea of what that developmental curve looks like for those guys. And then you try and pick and choose uh, once you've got the background and the bio information selected on guys uh, games that are going to show you a nice spectrum of what this player is capable of doing. So I want to see a game that shows the lows. I want to see show, see a game that shows the highs and I want to see uh, against top competition. So I will be much more, choosy with the games that I'm watching over the course of the summer because I want to see the game that that wide receiver logs three catches for 28 yards and that's it and then I want to see the the 25 rushes for 210 yards that a that a running back might be able to put out there so I want to see the peaks and the valleys and really set my expectation based off of what that spectrum looks like do you find yourself, Kyle, kind of being a little bit more optimistic this time of year? I know I was just having this conversation with somebody uh, at lunch, actually. When you're watching players in the summer, you almost like have this like a little bit more of a uh, a positive look on these guys. You're like, you know what? They've got a full another full season to improve. So you know, I'm, I'm going to cling a little bit more to the positives and not knock them too much on the negatives. You're going to keep them down. You're going to write them in the report that you write in the summer, but you don't want to knock them too much because you're kind of hoping, hey, look, this guy has another full year to improve, another 12, 13, up to 15 games to get better. Are you kind of banking on that, or is it really kind of consistent across the board? Oh, heck yeah. You, you want to assume that that progression as it takes place is going to be linear and it's always going to point upwards at all times. And really great case study for that for me, looking back in retrospect last year, my first year with the Draft Network was I did the Big Ten exclusively last year over the course of the summer and then had to familiarize myself with the rest of the conference as I went. And there were two guys, David Edwards, the right tackle from Wisconsin, and Michigan State quarterback Brian Lewerke. Both of those guys I studied through the summer. I really like the traits that they showed, and I said, hey, you know, Edwards was initially a tight end, high school quarterback, so what's to say this guy who is big, looks pretty nimble, he meets the size thresholds, he's a, a mauler in the run game, that that pass set doesn't get better, that he doesn't clean up that footwork a little bit. Well, lo and behold, it didn't happen, even though he had another 13 games to work on it. Brian Lewerke, I watched uh, some of the two-minute drill stuff that he did, the the work against Penn State in 2017, the game against Northwestern where he threw for over 400 yards, uh, the the bowl game against Washington State that was his best game of the year in 2017. I said, hey, this guy's got a live arm. He's accurate. He had some clutch moments in key game situations. I really like what that projects and what that looks like. And he was just off the rails bad last year. Now, he's got an opportunity in 2018 to reassess that, 
but I'm certainly not rolling into this year with it, with that level of optimism that I had with Lewerke. And we didn't see the, the development come from David Edwards that I was projecting with my optimism when I said this might be a top 50 player when it's all said and done. So you certainly have that optimism. You project that development onto these guys, but that's why this process is so fluid and you, you really can't marry yourself to the school of thought that you have now. It's just setting your expectation more than anything. Kyle, take us back in time a little bit. I, I want to hear about kind of your beginnings and, and really what made you want to get into the business of evaluating college players and trying to project them to the NFL. How did you want to get started or how did you get started? What caused you to get that way? And then uh, who were some of your biggest influences earlier in your career? Sure. Well, I initially had intended on uh, playing football at the University of Indiana University of Pennsylvania, and I was hurt my senior year of high school and was not in a position to play. I lost a ton of weight, and I just kind of wrote it off. So I, I transitioned into coaching. I coached the high school level when I was in college, and then the work-life balance of school and, and doing my undergraduate degree and trying to balance that with, with coaching – in the falls was very difficult. So I kind of asked myself what was next for me. And one of my biggest influences is a guy who now I believe works with uh, NFL next gen. He'd worked with roster watch for a while. He worked with the Minnesota Vikings, Mike band, who's a former NFL scout. Uh, I had known him through passing uh, when he was working his way up through the scouting ranks. He went to school at the university of Florida and uh, through conversations that we had had, he's like, you know, you, you know, football pretty well, you know, if this is something you're interested in, you know, see where it goes, just kind of commit yourself to it. And, you know, here's some of the, the notes that I've had that have been helpful for me. And that kind of gave me my platform to get started. And I give him a lot of credit for encouraging me to, to put myself out there and expose myself to this steep learning curve of how to evaluate players. And uh, one of the other people that I've met throughout the, the course of my works is Gary Horton, who founded, uh, worked with Todd McShay uh, and through Scouts Inc. before that got acquired by ESPN and, and Gary Horton, who did some advisory work for Fan Rag Sports, which I contributed did with for a few years. The conversations that I had with him were a great revelation as far as transitioning my own school of thought and, and how I was coached at the high school level and, and how the coaches that I was around as I was coaching and through networking, the scouts that I had met, marrying all of those things together and really figuring out how to try to replicate and emulate an NFL scouting thought process and not changing player grades for injuries. You know, you, you mark those guys with red flags and the horizontal big board that I've been working with over the last two years now has, has really been helpful for me to kind of take my school of thought and my football intelligence and being a student of the game and applying all those things in a way that makes me a better scout. So I give those two guys the most credit as far as being influences for me. Well, I think that's one of the cool things that, that you guys do at the Draft Network is you send your people out on the road. I mean, you guys aren't just sitting uh, you know, on your couch uh, like I do for most weeks uh, watching games on Saturdays. A lot of times you guys are on the road. You're in press boxes going shoulder to sholdre, elbow to elbow uh, with NFL scouts and evaluators on the road. What was that experience like over the course of this past fall? And are you guys going to continue doing that this year? What was that like? And how would you juxtapose uh, what you're able to do on a weekly basis with that uh, of an NFL scout? Yeah, so it, it's a really great experience to be able to sit in those conditions, introduce yourself to those people, talk with those people, and just kind of get inside their head a little bit. You know, that's something for me, I've been credentialed going to games for, this will be my fifth year of going to games. Uh, believe my busiest year was 2017. I went to Iowa City for Michigan, Iowa. I went out to uh Tucson for an Arizona game against Utah and, and Arizona State versus Oregon. So I could see Justin Herbert as a true freshman. And those experiences for me really kind of forced you to look at football not as a one on one or look at the player in a vacuum, but to rather just look at organically all 22 pieces and all 22 players on the field and watch it from that perspective. Because when you're in the press box, I have always had the most success watching the offense and the defense together and what those movements look like and then being able to identify who's the guy that's out of place for good or for bad. And once you learn and, and take that step back and not just watch the football, for example, a lot of casual fans watch the ball. I mean, the fantasy football has really promoted that mentality of 
you know, if you're not touching the ball, then why should I care? But if you're looking at it from a scout side, being able to see and understand what all pieces on both sides of the line of scrimmage are supposed to be doing and identify if a guy's exceeding or failing at what he's being asked to do, that was a big revelation for me. And those experiences really spawned from sitting in the press box, talking to scouts in the box, talking to scouts before the games, as far as things that they're looking for. Well, you talked about you know some of the people that have impacted your your career and the, who you've learned from. You talked about Mike Ban and Gary Horton, uh, two guys that are there obviously have been in the, in the business for a while. How do you feel? And you and you've had your other experiences outside of that. How do you feel that your previous experiences have helped build you where you're at now? Are there things that you feel like you do that might be kind of specific to you? Obviously, other people are going to do them, but really have been more of a, a result of what you've done earlier in your career. Sure. So when I started on my own, uh, it was all about as I'm learning to do things, learning how to apply the the trial and error that comes with scouting and being somebody who came up through the ranks without having experience working for a team. A lot of people look at that as on my resume and they say, well, well what makes you qualified to talk about it. And it's no different than anybody else. If you understand the concepts of the game and you, you get yourself in situations that you can apply what you know works and what you know does not work, and you're willing to own the mistakes that you make, one of the things that I've really enjoyed doing this summer that I'd love to see more people talk openly about is the mistakes that you make. One of the things that I did, uh, over the the course of the past two weeks over the draft network is I put together the top 40 highest grades that I had given out in pre-draft assessments from 2017 to 2019. And I put all those guys on a board and I said, where are they now? Some of those guys just got drafted. Maybe they didn't get drafted as high as I thought they should have. Some of those guys met and even exceeded my expectations. Eddie Jackson was outside of the top 100 picks in 2017. He might be the best safety in football now. And that was a guy for me, I pounded the table for. But then you've also got other guys who have failed to meet the expectations that you have. Patrick Mahomes was one for me that did not make that list at all. And he's arguably the best quarterback in football. But you look and you you read the assessment and you read what the conditions were going to be that are going to allow a player to succeed or fail and the context was good, just the valuation of that was incorrect because I couldn't project him into specifically what he was going to get in Kansas City. So I I enjoy talking about where things went right and where things went wrong because I feel confident enough in my process that I'm doing the right things. Yeah, you, you talk about your process, and we're all trying to evolve and get better and do and you know tweak what we're doing and try and put out the best product possible, whether it's internal or you know we're putting out content uh, like like what you were doing over the draft network. So let me ask you this: What do you feel are your biggest strengths as an evaluator, and what are your big, biggest weaknesses? Obviously, none of us are per- perfect. What do you feel are your biggest strengths and your biggest weaknesses uh, as an evaluator? One of my biggest strengths is I, I I've really grown to appreciate the fundamentals and the technique and, and guys who well, we, I'd reference late bloomers, maybe guys who weren't optimal athletes coming out of the high school level. Those guys, if they get by and they make it to the NFL level, typically those guys are super refined and I've got a great appreciation for what that looks like, what that implementation is and identifying those qualities on film, understanding leverage and hand technique and and how to attack certain blocks if you're a linebacker filling downhill or what your aiming points are if you're tackling in the open field those sorts of things I have a great appreciation for I think my biggest weakness and it's always been my biggest weakness is trying to find the balance of all of the information that's available to you how do you quantify athletic testing how do you quantify production that's been a a very fluid process for me over the five or six years that I've done this as far as evolving that and tweaking that, Fran, as you mentioned, it's a nonstop process to continue tinkering with because there is no perfect process. And if there was, everybody would be out of a job because it'd be really easy to scout football players. So for me, it's just putting the the proper filters on all the information that's available to you and trying to prevent that from introducing conscious or subconscious biases into your evaluations. 
So for young people out there that are thinking about getting into it, or you know maybe they're a little bit older and they do, they want to just become better uh, at evaluating college players, what's some advice that you would give to uh, a novice in that area that wants to get better? Sure. Uh, I think first and foremost, there are a lot of great resources out there for people to watch. Uh, coaches clinics the last three years have been my favorite part of the summer. I get a great opportunity to sit down and watch Nick Saban for 75 minutes talk about coverage techniques and and pattern matching and Bill O'Brien talking about route concepts and Dante Scarnecchia talking about offensive line blocking schemes and this stuff's out there if you know where to look. So do some research on YouTube, do some research as far as there are things that you products that you can sign up for and consume these coaches clinics, these videos. I mean, it, it, it really shifts your, your perception of the game and it's, it looks so easy because they're professional athletes but nothing that they do on a football field is easy unless they are the absolute elite of the elite, but they make it look easy. But you, when you appreciate how much attention to detail there is, I just watched the, uh, the Akeem Hicks segment with Ron Jaworski and Brian Baldinger, and, and he's talking about his reads of an offensive lineman and knowing before the play that he's pulling and automatically knowing that center is going to have a back block on him based on the read of the weight distribution on an offensive lineman's fingertips, that level and depth, when you become a student of the game of football and you, you consume enough materials that that makes sense to you and you can start to at least understand what the thought process is there, that's a really big game changer to becoming a smarter fan and a smarter evaluator. So let's talk about the the 2020 class, the 2019 season. Uh, you're obviously knee deep now in evaluating players. I know uh, you just watched last night. I believe I saw DeAndre Swift uh, over at the Draft Network on the, on your Twitch channel. Uh, who are some of the players that have caught your eye so far for 2019? Uh, yeah, I really really like this Iowa right tackle Tristan Wirfs. Uh, impressive physical specimen, big body, fluid, athletic. I do not know what they put in the water in Iowa for their (laughs) offensive lineman, but he's the next one in the lineage of really good Iowa offensive linemen to come through. You got Scherf and and James Daniels in recent years, and Wirfs is another one of those guys. Uh, I like Penn State's Yatergros Matos as a developmental player. This is one of those players that I'm trying not to get too optimistic with, with as far as his linear progression and getting better as a football player. He had eight sacks and 20 tackles for loss last year for Penn State. Uh, Number 99, he's hard to miss because he's massive and he's long and athletic. He's still a little raw as a pass rusher. He takes too many offensive tackle sets, uh, full man instead of half man. So he needs to set up his pass rushes better. And I don't want to assume he's going to do that. But a lot of his tackle for loss production is because he's a really, really good athlete for his size and really fluid. And then, of course, the top names, you look at Tua Tagovailoa, and uh, he's got some areas of improvement, but as far as his natural talent and ability, I think he's perfectly fine with arm strength. He's super smart uh, as far as dissecting coverages and, and being able to make those reads. Uh, and I think you had mentioned my, my watching of DeAndre Swift. I think running back one is going to be a popular debate this year with yeah. guys like Jonathan Taylor and uh, DeAndre Swift. For me, that guy is Travis Etienne. Uh, I think his contact balance is super special at Clemson and the fact that he's back with Trevor Lawrence and T Higgins and, and Ross is, is just going to be phenomenal for football fans in general to watch. Yeah, you mentioned uh, your Turk Gross motto. So one of my favorite things to do at the Combine every year is kind of talk with these players about who's next, who's coming down the pipeline. I can't tell you how many Big Ten players – how many Penn State offensive linemen, because there were a couple of them uh, in Indianapolis, how many of the Penn State defensive linemen just raved about Gross Matos and what he can do uh, and what he will be able to do this fall. So he's certainly a guy uh, I'll be keeping my eye on. Last question for you, uh, quick uh, pub. What what are some of the things that we can expect from the Draft Network uh, over the next couple of months? I know you've had some turnover. You've had some new additions uh, to the staff. So what are some things we can expect from a content standpoint uh, leading up to the season? Yeah, it's an exciting time for us because we have new members on staff. We're adding, we're growing. And one of the things you you asked the right guy, Fran, I'm actually the guy that puts together the content calendar for the Draft Network. So I've got the whole month of July queued up here. Nice. Just, just what do you want to know? So Ben Solak is going to be doing uh, a series on 
what the pathway looks like for all 32 teams to win the Super Bowl in 2019. Some of those will be much more likely than others, but he's going to lay all that out. Joe Marino's doing team superlatives on all 32 teams. Uh, I'm going to be looking back at the 2016 NFL draft. You say that you need three years of players in the league to kind of evaluate what those players became and if they're hits or misses or busts. And I'm going to be spending a lot of time looking back at that 2016 draft class and, and really assessing what went right and what went wrong with those players now that we can make those definitive observations about them. A lot of film study as well. And we're also going to be doing uh, big boards for positions of all time. So a big board of all time quarterbacks, what that looks like, a big board of all time running backs. And uh, that's going to be a really fun series too. So this is a great time of year for us in July and kind of the quiet time to have some fun, wind the clock back, do some retrospect uh, and study the players that have been successful in years past in the NFL and what made them so good and uh, how you can use that and weaponize that to look for the next round of players who are going to be great NFL players. Yeah, I'm sure there won't be any uh, controversy or debates with those uh, all-time no. big boards. Never. <laughs> well, Kyle, really appreciate it. Excited for you guys going into year two over at the Draft Network. Excited to see what you guys churn out uh, in your guys' second year of business. We'll appreciate the time here, as always, on the Journey to the Draft podcast. We'll talk to you soon, buddy. It's almost here. Thanks, friend. Well, great stuff there from Kyle, and you can follow him just like I do on Twitter at Grinding the Tape. You can follow all the rest of the Draft Network crew as well at the Draft Network. They produce great NFL draft content throughout the course of the calendar year, and like I said earlier, we're going to continue having them on the show throughout the course of the season and the offseason, really just talking about college prospects as they project to the NFL. All right, let's get into one section here. We've got our draft mailbag, and this week we're going to go to our Apple podcast page because, again, that's the number way to support the show. I, I appreciate everybody that promotes it in social media, but if you go on wherever you listen, whether it's on Stitcher or on Apple Podcasts or any of those platforms, just go and leave us a rating and leave us a comment. It helps boost us up the rankings a little bit. The college football season is coming, so any little support we can get, we're going to take it. It really helps our show in the long run. So, got a great comment this week, a question from Crop David who asks, Mr. Duffy, there's a saying, and I appreciate you calling me Mr. Duffy, that's a, a rare one. There is a saying I hear amongst baseball coaches that the easiest way to get to the big leagues is to become a catcher or a left-handed pitcher. Obviously, any professional sport is not easy, but what would you say is the easiest path, quote-unquote, to play in the NFL? I would guess pass rushers considering today's game, but you can never have enough offensive linemen, too. Congrats on your family's new journey with the birth of your son. I, I like to play on words there and do appreciate the well wishes as well, not just from you, but also from everybody out there in social media uh, with the birth of our son a couple weeks ago. But now let's talk uh, with the question. And it's a good question, David. I think really when you're looking at the NFL, what's the easiest way? Well, the easiest way is you're going to become a specialist, right? If you want to be a kicker or a punter or a long snapper, that's the easiest way. You know, I don't want to say anybody can do it, but any body type, any level of, ath of raw athleticism, can. if you can kick the ball 90 yards or if you can snap the ball as fast as some of these guys can do it and then run down the field, you can get into the NFL. But look, it, all these guys, and when you see them up close, they are physical marvels. It is hard to make it into the NFL if you are not a big, strong, athletic, powerful human being. It's very, very difficult. So, you know, while you mentioned, yeah, the need is there for offensive linemen, the need is there for pass rushers, but as, as much as I personally could have wanted to, there's no way the way that I'm built and with what my athletic gifts were that I would have been able to make it as a pass rusher or an offensive lineman in the NFL. If you are blessed with those gifts, I encourage you to go and, and give that a shot because that would be uh, worth your while. But uh, not everybody is blessed with that. So I would say, look, if you want to play, play on your gifts, if you can run, then you want to try and be a corner if you want to try. That's why, honestly, and I always kind of think to back to high school recruiting because my initial job was with Temple football and had a lot to do uh, with just the overall recruiting process and just kind of following that to me is fascinating. I don't follow as close uh, as I used to, but you know, you talk about these uh, these kids. There's a million receivers out there coming from the high school level, right? And some of them are you know six one, six two, and you know maybe they're two star receivers and don't have much of a, a, a hope to play in the NFL as they're sitting there in high school. I would say to those guys, look, if you want to, if you really want to look at it, a six-one-six-two receiver not going to get a lot of looks. A six-one-six-two corner 
Now you're now you're cooking with gas. That's what the NFL is looking for uh, at that position now. And I would say you can look across the board and say a lot of those things, right? A lot of the people that would say, oh, a 220-pound li- uh, linebacker 10 years ago, probably not going to get a sniff. You're going to be a strong safety these days. No, those that's the guys. Those are the guys that are in vogue. So uh, you know, you just kind of want to play on the what the trends in the league are and what the trends in the game are. But uh, ultimately, yeah, fastest path. If you have a child that you're hoping, uh, you know, they're going to try and get to the NFL. Teach them how to snap a football. It's uh, that would be the the easy ticket, I think, to get into the league. So great question there uh, from Crop David. Again, really appreciate everybody that promotes this podcast on all forms of social media. Check out the Eagle Line the Sky podcast this week. Earlier this week, I caught up with Josh Gaddis, who's the uh, Michigan offensive coordinator. Great conversation. Uh, he gave a ton of information uh, about the wide receiver position from snap to finish, all kinds of technique things. I, I was taking notes uh, as we were recording the show. I actually went back and gave it a listen afterwards to pick up some things uh, that I may have missed. And next week, we've got Matt Rule, the head coach from Baylor University, joining the show over on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast. So make sure, go and check those interviews out. We talk about some college players, but also big picture things. And Matt's going to talk all about the red zone on both sides of the ball, which will be a really fun discussion. So uh, again, thanks for joining us here on the Journey to the Draft podcast. We'll be back next week. We're going to continue this series over the course of the next few weeks. Our conference previews will pick up here, I want to say mid-July. So keep an eye out for that here in just a couple of weeks. For those of you uh, that celebrate the holiday next week, enjoy. If you're not in the country and you're listening, uh, have a great week and we'll see you next time here on the Journey to the Draft podcast.